Um, my name is Daria Bakker Lattimore, and I'm the president of the National Alliance for HIV Education and Workforce Development, also known as NAHUD. And welcome to today's webinar, which is, I believe, the fifth in our national webinar series, Bridging HIV, HCV, and Substance Use Disorder Innovations in the Field. We are this webinar series hosted by NAHUD in partnership with the AIDS Education Training Center Program and the Opioid Response Network. Um, also joining me today is Nahu's treasurer and the co-PI in the grant funding this series is Vanessa Carson Sasso. This session is going to be recorded and made available as a resource on our website within about one week. So Nahu is a membership organization of the eight regional and two national AEPCs. We were established in 2010. We support the AEPC program which is a component of the HRSA-funded Ryan White AIDS program. It has an explicit directive to build and maintain a well-educated and culturally sensitive health professional workforce that can provide prevention, diagnosis, care and treatment, and medical management for people at risk for and living with HIV. NAHU collaborates with multiple organizations in order to promote and educate <laughs> Since 2018, NAHU has been funded by the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry as a partner organization of the Opioid Response Network to address the intersection of HIV and opioid use disorder. ORM was created to support efforts in addressing the prevention, treatment, and recovery of op opioid use disorder and provides free resources and TA locally in communities across the United States and its territory. You can visit the ORM website and request, uh, submit a request for technical assistance there. So we will be offering continuing education credits today. Please note the directions on this slide if you're interested in obtaining credits and or a certificate of attendance. So you'll need to properly complete the post-evaluation survey. And we will include the link in that survey as we, towards the end of this session today. So certificates will be emailed to you within two weeks of completing the evaluation. And of course, it's your responsibility to verify the requirements of your state licensing board. So now I am pleasure, and my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. I'm going to stop sharing. Here we go. So Dr. Alice Thornton. Dr. Thornton is, is a professor of medicine in the University of Kentucky Department of Eternal Medicine and chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases. Dr. Thornton has been involved in many aspects of the Ryan White program, including Ryan White B, C, and D, and as the local performance site of the Southeast AIDS Education and Training Center. She is also active in NIH research and has served as grant reviewer for the NIH, CDC, and HRSA, and has served on the HIPAA board of directors. So welcome, Dr. Thornton, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, um, both Daria, Liz, and Vanessa, for this opportunity. And I'm going to see if I can share my slides. Did I do it wrong? I think it's there. Yeah. All right. So thank you again, everyone. And I need to give a shout out to whoever it was on here from Huntington, West Virginia. That's my home state. So thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Right. So here are our learning objectives. Um, we're gonna talk about different models of care that we've been able to do here at the University of Kentucky. And we're also, as we go through these, we'll talk about the different barriers or obstacles that we've um, encountered as we've worked through this. And I must say that this truly has been a, um, a collaborative effort. Uh, it's definitely a coordinated team-based, although I'm the person that has the privilege today of getting to the, share this information by no means is this my work. And as a matter of fact, I've probably played a very small role in a lot of this. So you can see here, we started out as the Bluegrass Care Clinic. And um, on the left was the building that we recently moved out of. And I'm just so excited that we're now in this brand new building and our mascots are black vultures that sometimes land on my windowsill. Um, so we're very happy to be here. And we are an HIV primary care clinic 
and you can see the different services. Like so many other programs across the country, we uh, have the Ryan White Alphabet Soup. We have Ryan White Parts B, C, and D, and then F with the AETC. And you can see that we do HIV care, primary care, and a lot of the other wraparound services. We're very excited that now we have a much fuller mental health component than we ever had. And we're so happy to have those colleagues with us. And then um, another key point that I think has helped make us successful is we've always had pharmacy support and now we actually have a full-time pharmacist, which is huge. And then today we're gonna touch on a lot of the work that we've been doing in the area of addiction medicine. Um, if you look at this slide, and I'm not sure you can, if, if it's too huge for you to see, but this is actually a slide showing um, the, um, num the percentage of patients that are newly diagnosed with HIV that have injection drug use or substance use as their risk factor for HIV. So in about 2018, you can see that we topped up to 14%, but we started seeing a trend in about 2008 to 2010 and then spiked again. So it was like each couple of years, we hit a new threshold. And so this was really troubling. And a lot of this was Oxycontin and then moving over to heroin and then met methamphetamines. Um, by 2016 or really 2015, we knew we had a problem. And many of our patients um, were using drugs and we didn't ask, we didn't know. And so we didn't have really a plan of how to deal with this. And it was a really stressful time at, during that period. And one of my wonderful colleagues, Dr. Laura Finucchi, who now is addiction medicine certified, um, through our encouragement, she applied to Age United for a HRSA SPINS grant. And so she was part of this integrating buprenorphine treatment for opioid use disorder in HIV primary care. And this was really a true building block for us for our first step in having an organized fashion on how to deal with this. And so patients that came in for their HIV primary care at our location at the Bluegrass Care Clinic and were diagnosed with opioid use disorder would be enrolled in a program with her and a dyad, which was um, a, a person who is a, a social work uh, mental health counselor. So it was just the two of them with some of us supporting. Definitely they had my support, but it was a, a mighty team of two uh, starting out that effort. And this is a slide um, with so many of us talk about the CDC identified vulnerable counties. Um, Kentucky, this does not show all of them, but Kentucky has about 50 of those 220 counties that are at great risk for uh, HIV and hepatitis C epidemic. And so you can see the blue is the, the counties that we, that patients come to us with the little red dot. And we have lots of patients that travel many hours, two and three hours to come and see us. And so, and you can see that these were the, um, the um, pa where these patients come from and that many patients in their areas are at great risk of developing HIV and hep C because of the opioid epidemic. Um, so in this first uh, project that Dr. Fanuki was involved in, we called it the Age United Grant <laughs> or the, the BUP uh, initiative, but I'll just say Age United. So with this, this program, during the, the period of time that it was operating, um, we had 67 patients that were referred within our program, and these were HIV-infected patients. 44 of them attended at least one visit. Of those 44, 37 received buprenorphine and sorry, I have to move this a little bit. And then two of them received Vivitrol, which is the injection. Um, and then five of them were not prescribed medication. And some of those that chose um, not to be involved, it was because they either didn't show up for their induction or they decided this is not what I wanna do, but there were you know, various reasons given. Um, so that, with that program, what did we learn from that? What were some of our takeaways? So what we discovered, and I'm sure many of you are gonna find that this resonates with you, that many of our patients that were enrolled in this program had significant trauma. Many of them had comorbid mental illness and there were additional substance use disorders. So it wasn't just uh, opioid use disorder, it was many other, it was poly, poly substance for the most part. And we aim to provide as low barrier treatment as we could, trying to remove as many barriers so that our patients could get the help that they needed. 
And most patients needed more help. And I, I was really, I've been doing, at that point, you know, I was doing HIV care for at least 18 plus years. And I was just really struck by how intense case management was often needed compared to what I thought was our needy HIV alone patients, but patients that had this comorbid opioid use disorder, it seemed to me that it was even more intense case management. Our providers really needed dedicated clinic time to provide this opioid use disorder treatment. And often uh, we found that the patients needed to be seen more frequently. So that was something that we hadn't necessarily thought about. And then one thing that we always had to keep reminding ourselves was to be patient. And we had to keep a trauma-informed perspective because many of our patients, as I mentioned, came from this background. And we learned that we had to celebrate even the small victories with our clients or our patients, no matter how small. And so the fact that the person showed up, even if they didn't decide to do the buprenorphine, sometimes them just showing up for that appointment was a huge victory. Some other key tips and takeaways that we found was that it did take strong leaders. Dr. Fanuki is a, a very strong leader. I tried to be a strong leader and support her. And we tried to get buy-in from the entire clinic. We did need to scale up services for that, and that was obvious as we went through, you know, how can we make this better? What will we do now, you know, when things end? And definitely we decided that there needed to be a scale up. Um, mainly this is because patients with dual diagnosis of HIV and opioid use disorder had a lot of needs, and it was wide ranging. There were a lot of legal challenges for the patients um, that we had to try to help with case management to help them meet those needs. There was ina inadequate housing, mental health disorders we've already mentioned, and this polysubstance use. I've already alluded to the intensive case management that was really a big deal. And then we had to build capacity for our clinic. We really, um, you know, I hate to say it, but we really had our head in the sand and weren't really addressing the problems. And so uh, we had to realize that we had a problem and needed to start building that. And at that point, we only had one mental health counselor. This wasn't counting the person that was part of the dyad. And so that was another thing that we knew that we had to build up that number of mental health staff. And we had to increase our treatment resources. One of the things that we found is that, that it's often a challenge just, just to get the clients or patients to the clinic. Because we live, um, Lexington is urban, but most of our patients, uh, or 50% of our patients are rural. And so addressing their transportation issues, of course, was really important. And then we found many of our patients did not have good communications lines. They didn't have telephones or ways that we could reach them. And so that was also things that had to be addressed. And then we found that if you ask, you will find before, we didn't necessarily know about all the drug use that was going on in our clinic because we didn't necessarily ask. And so this was a change that has occurred in our clinic is now that we do ask our patients about substance use. Back then, we didn't necessarily ask. We needed to create an, envi create an environment where people could feel that they could disclose that substance use. And I'm not sure we had that before. One of our biggest goals was to stabilize the patients, improve their health and quality of life, and create a plan for the sustained services. That was some of our takeaways that we needed. And I will also throw in there that anytime we talk about this, we have to say, you know, improve their quality, quality of life, but also keep them alive and save their life often. Some of the challenges, I've already alluded to some of this, so I won't go repeat it, but transportation. So how did we address that? We often did this uh, through um, public, public transportation is not really a huge thing in Kentucky. And so uh, if they were right in Lexington, yes, they could, they could ride a bus, but many of our patients did not come from Lexington. And so we had to have ride services that we hired, Medicaid transportation, of course, we are Medicaid transportation, uh, Medicaid expansion site. So that's a little bit easier, but it doesn't solve all your problems. We use a lot of gas cards, taxis, Uber health, things like that. I've already alluded to the multiple substances that we found. Lately, uh, fentanyl has definitely been more of a problem. And personally, I've been seeing more patients with cocaine um, come in as well. And then services, I've already alluded to how complicated these patients are. And so often we would have complicated medical needs. And I, and I felt it was definitely more intense than anything I'd ever seen before in our past legal problems we touched on, psychosocial challenges and mental health, and then stigma. 
we had stigma within our system. Our healthcare providers, including myself at different times, had stigma toward these patients where they experienced the stigma from us and then our community. And then one of the things that we found as we've been involved more with the patients and their families in the hospital is often the family members and their, their culture was, well, we're not interested in MAT or MOUD because you're just substituting one drug for another one. And so we had to help patients look, um, get beyond that. Um, then next, as this started run, um, winding down, was how do we go from here? What kind of sustainability plan do we have? And so we wanted to, before we were sort of co-located, we wanted it to be more integrated, not siloed. And so that means that we meant that we had to expand the people giving, them, giving MOUD. And so Dr. Fanuki continues continues to have one clinic a week with us. But um, Ms. Stivers, our APRN, um, she definitely came on board and was trained by Dr. Fanuki. I got my training. I, I do not feel that I'm the best, but I'm in there trying. And then since then, we've had three other, four other, yeah, four, but since then we've had four other newer people that are also trained and willing to be involved in treatment. It's definitely, um, we needed more funding. Uh, we could use our Part B, but we realized that we needed to think about our non-HIV patients that were at great risk of HIV. And so obviously being a Ryan White clinic, we couldn't use those funds. So we looked for other funds and uh, first we looked at uh, SAMHSA and then we ended up doing the core funding, which is the Kentucky Opioid Response Effort, which uses those funds, the SAMHSA funds for that. And so that was how we um, thought about a different, uh, expanding the program and using different funds. So this is our uh, large complex. We, we are now a little bit on the outskirts um, in the suburbs, but this is our, our on-campus complex, our UK Healthcare. This is our largest hospital, which is about 500 bed. It's Chandler. And then uh, the medical school is all part of this. And so you can see where we are there. So around, I've already mentioned as 2008, 2010, 2012 as key, key years, but around 2018, 2019, something, it continued to get worse. And we continued to have patients in our hospital with serious uh, infections. And so we were seeing lots of patients with heart valve infections known as endocarditis, osteomyelitis, which is bone infections and other infections related to injection drug use. By 2018, we had 400 patients in-house with endocarditis, and 73% of those cases were from uh, were in patients who had a diagnosis of substance use. So where did we go from here? So I've already mentioned this funding that we were looking at. Um, and before I go into the funding, let me just again point out, so I've shown you this map previously. So again, the blue is the area that we serve. Um, the yellow dots were actually a study that we did, finished in 2012, where we identified all the counties where endocarditis cases were. And then the dark blue dots were those CDC identified counties that are at great risk of HIV and hepatitis C. So you can see all of this begins to overlap. Um, also looking at this, uh, about the time that we were starting to think about um, other uh, funding. In 2020, we hit some of our highest percentage of newly diagnosed HIV uh, patients identifying injection drug use as a risk factor, and that was 24%. So this is the RAP project, which is yet another program um, that we've used, and this is wraparound services uh, for addiction, and it's the infectious disease program. And really we modeled this after the Ryan White model. So you guys know, if you're a Ryan White program, that it's a successful model and we can get a lot of work done. And I think, I, I think part of our success is having these wraparound services, often from our Part B, or if your Part C also has wraparound social, psychosocial services. We, so we felt like we needed this and we needed a program that could extend both to HIV infected and those at risk for HIV. We also felt that it wasn't enough just to look at the patients that were in our Bluegrass Care Clinic, our outpatient, but we needed to look in our inpatient and try to offer some kind of connection into our clinic. And then we also, as of late, 
uh, as our state has expanded and had more and more syringe exchange programs or syringe service programs, we often have patients that are referred from our community partners. Um, we wanted to be intentional in what we could do. At the time, it was myself. Um, Dr. Finucchi, of course, was very willing to train us, but she has other initiatives she was working on, and it was um, our nurse practitioner, Tiffany. And so we knew that um, our, our hands were a bit limited, and so um, we knew that we were going to have to both facilitate, provide care, but also facilitate at other sites as well. And then um, we used the GIPRAs, our state um, that has funded this did require us to do these GIPRAs, which are surveys that we ask patients and get in-depth information about them over, over our, our time period that we follow them. So this is what our RAP services provide. To be enrolled in the RAP, you have to have a substance use disorder. And at the time when we started, it was only opioid use that has been expanded now to include other substance use. But at the time it was just opioid uh, use. And now, now this year it's been expanded. And they had to have an infection related to their injection drug use or their opioid use disorder. And so that could be HIV, Hep C, bone infections, heart infections, you know, whatever. Um, and these are the services through this small um, grant that we offer. Case management is a big part of it. And then you can see the other things listed here, recovery support, harm reduction, relapse and overdose prevention. Linkage to care is a big piece of what we do, trying to serve as that bridge, again, often from outpatient to inpatient. And then another big piece is either to provide um, medicines, medications for opioid use disorder, or to coordinate with another program. And then a big part is transportation. We might not see the patient uh, for opioid use ourselves, but we make sure that um, they can get the care they need. And so there's a lot of transportation and coordination. So what were the questions that we wondered about as we looked at this program. And so we wondered, could we apply the Rhyme White Care Act treatment model to patients with substance use disorder that may or may not have HIV? Would this treatment model improve patient outcomes? And we wondered, was it feasible to implement this within our larger infectious diseases clinic? And the RAP team um, is a multidisciplinary team. So this came very naturally since this is mainly, you know, this is very much what a Rhyme White clinic is. Many of us are multidisciplinary. So we had, um, I was the initial principal investigator. And thankfully, I have other people coming in. And Dr. Grubbs graciously accepted to be the PI. I've continued to be involved. And Dr. Sarah Blevins, our wonderful pharmacist, has been very involved. I call her instead of a horse whip whisperer, she's a drug use whisperer, <laughs> really has a lot of experience um, in helping these patients. We now have um, the four people listed here. Nicole Akey is a newer mental health uh, PA that's with us that um, her uh, area of expertise is behavioral health and psych. And so she's one of our newer people. And then we have four other MDs, or well, three other MDs, including Dr. Grubbs, um, that have joined us. And then Dr. Fanuki continues to teach and be very much a part and follows five patients not involved in RAP. And then I've already mentioned Sarah. And then we, a very key important, important point is to have that social work or program coordination, mental health. And then we mentioned the case management. And then we've had some other grant and data support. So what does this look like in reality? So what happens on campus, we have five infectious disease consult teams between our two hospitals. And so when the infectious disease consult team encounters a patient that has opioid use disorder and now polysubstance use, they refer the patient to the RAP team. It can also, the referral could also come within our clinic. Um, it could be someone that's referred in for hepatitis C. And then of course, our HIV patients that it's discovered that they have issues. And also I mentioned already the syringe access programs. And so there is another team that we're gonna talk about, which is the inpatient addiction medicine team, but they can also reach out and engage, the, engage us in the care as well. So once that happens, members of our teams, either the program coordinator or the case manager meets with the patient wherever they are, be it the hospital, the clinic, over the phone, however we can find them. 
obtains consent to be part of our program, they do that baseline um, survey or questionnaire that we talked about. And then the patients can receive their MOUD if they're interested either at our clinic or outside our clinic and we help coordinate that care. And then they, a part of our program is for them to complete, if it's, a, if it's an infectious disease that can be cured, to complete that infectious disease goal. So if they have endocarditis, a heart valve infection, that usually is about six weeks of antibiotics. And so we wanna make sure that person completes that therapy, that they have their follow-up. If they have hep C, we wanna make sure they get their hep C treatment. Um, we've had some patients go ahead and get on PrEP, um, by coming in as a RAP patient. And so whatever their treatment goals, we want to help them accomplish those. So what have we been doing since 2019 when we first started enrolling? So we've had about 666 referrals. Of those, 191 were ineligible. So we have 475 eligible. We were able to actually approach 283. And I know that's a huge number, but a lot of times those patients either left the hospital uh, were discharged before we could get to them or, or they were referred, but we could never get a hold of them if they were referred by the syringe exchange program when we're calling them. 172 were actually enrolled. When we look at our demographics for this population, it's a little bit different than our Ryan White Clinic. For this population, um, it's largely uh, almost equal female male. For our Ryan White program, it's 80, about 80% 80 male and 20% uh, female. With this population, it's largely white, 94%. And um, in our Ryan White big program uh, for HIV patients, it's about 80% white and um, 20% African American and then about 8% Hispanic. So this was a very, you know, it's a little bit different population. Uh, unfortunately, about 5.8% have been are deceased. And then these are the reasons that people might have been ineligible. And we list pregnancy here, not because we don't want to take care of pregnant women, but we have another program on site at the University of Kentucky um, that's just a fantastic program that deals with pregnant women and then pregnant women after the baby's born for about four years. So we really want pregnant women to engage in that program. So we didn't include them in this. The breakdown of those patients, as I mentioned, 172 ever enrolled, 56 actively enrolled, meaning they had contact within the last six months. So this is data from this fall. 18 were duly enrolled both in the Ryan White programs and the RAP program, meaning they're HIV positive and active in the programs. There's a total of 23 HIV that are on MOUD. Um, so that means there were five more patients that are receiving MOUD in our program that were in Dr. Fanuki's earlier program and did not sign up for the RAP. 38 are non-HIV actively followed. And here is the MOUD that we give the patients, Suboxone, Supplicate, Vivitrol, Narcan, Methadone. Um, and we don't give Methadone on site ourselves, but we help coordinate that. I've already mentioned some of this. I don't think I'm going to go that just about our demographics. And then looking at what, um, what again, what we were given, you can see that a large percentage of our patients take Suboxone. Um, and then more and more patients we find are in interested in methadone. We have had an uptick compared to when we initially started and when Dr. Fanuki, Fanuki initially started with the Sublocade. We find some patients really like that monthly injection. Um, and then uh, we have 30% of patients that no longer want to be on anything that are still being followed by us and letting us help, um, help them uh, as in their, in their struggle for recovery. Um, this is just some where some of the patients get their treatment and you can see about 17% of the patients get it at RAP. And then you can see a large percentage get it at the outside provider. And unfortunately, an even larger percentage of people have been lost to follow up. And this was our bigger, bigger group. Um, these are the support services. We've already talked about that, of course, individual counseling and self-help and support groups, transportation. You hear me say that a lot because that is a lot of what we do. And then just continuing their care, trying to help them accomplish those infectious disease goals as well as their opioid use disorder goals as well. 
Um, I've already alluded to um, a lot of comorbidities. So we see a lot of our patients that have hep C. It's our biggest infection that the patients will have or largest number. And then a lot of our patients with endocarditis also have hepatitis C. We don't have a lot of patients that are co-infected with hep C and HIV uh, as much as we do people with opioid use disorder and hep C. That is, that is our biggest uh, comorbidity. This is again, sorry, I know you're probably sick of seeing the, the map of Kentucky, but just to remind you again of, of those, so we had the service area, but now we've included something else. And you can see in the hatch marks that this was 2020, so we even have more now. I think we have about 70 syringe service programs. So you can see where the syringe service programs, the uh, at risk of HIV hep C outbreak by the CDC vulnerable county data. And then you can also see, um, um, yeah, so that was the main point of that. So what about the age group of these people? Um, many of them are in that 35 to 44, which is a little bit older than you might suspect. Um, and then that 45 to 54, I'm always surprised that our patients are a little bit older coming in with this. And then um, with this HIV infected patients, so I told you about the group at large, the majority were white, but you can see that with our agent HIV infected, we do have 9% that are African-American as well. So the good news um, with our HIV infected patients that are either enrolled in RAP or the five that are followed um, that were the previous uh, project that we had, those 23 patients, 91% of them have an undetectable viral load and 78% of them have a CD4 that's greater than 400, which I think is just wonderful numbers and success. We do not do this alone. And uh, one of the things we're gonna talk about is things to be aware of for your own self. But one, one thing to be aware is that you have to have higher levels of care or partners in care. And so these are all partners that we have. We have some inpatient folks that help us, definitely the methadone clinics and then miscellane miscellaneous programs. I'll mention the UK Bridge Clinic in a moment. And then UK has two other programs, a smart clinic that's worked um, out of the psychiatry department. And then UK Pathway is that wonderful pregnancy program that I mentioned. Um, this is something my colleague, um, Sarah Blevins, um, she tried to think about OUD in terms of the care continuum. And you can see from when patients are referred and then those that are eligible. And then there's like a 90% gap when you drop from referred to actual enrolled. And then another drop from those that actually start MOUD and then one month, three month and six month follow-up. So this continuum of care looks much worse than our HIV continuum of care. Um, what are those times of vulnerability? Sarah feels um, that there are key points, that key point, let me go back one, when they're, when, when they're deciding to start, you know, getting enrolled and starting to, um, wanting to start MOUD is really a vulnerable time for those patients. Um, if you look at what the one, three, and six month mark looks like, um, the one month mark is 80% from those that were enrolled are still there, three months it's about 35%, and by six months we only have 24%. So this is definitely something that's hard to sustain. From other programs that I've seen, that's about the numbers that I have seen. Um, so I wish I had a magic bullet um, on how to make that different, but that, that is what we see. What are some of the challenges with this program that maybe were different? Again, you can see this common thing of having to have time commitment of the ID providers. So it takes a lot of time to be involved. Um, hopefully this has gotten better from some of the recent um, um, legal changes that have come about, but just getting people to be trained and obtained a data waiver and prescribe buprenorphine. Um, it's, it's another thing, right, on our list of many, many hats that we wear. And so um, there's that provider reluctance. Uh, polysubstance use is difficult, particularly methamphetamine, since we don't have medication that's specifically known to make as huge a difference with methamphetamines. Geography for us being a rural place um, where there's not often 
uh, public transportation, that's tough. Reliable communication, we've already talked a little bit with the other program about telephones. Who knew that telephones would be so important for patients, but that's often very hard if they don't have a phone to be able to reach them. And then transportation, we've talked about. One other thing that during the time of COVID has become really a big problem for us. At one point, we did not, we only had the providers and um, our grant and data people um, for <laughs> to carry off for about a month, carry on. And it was because we needed, you know, our, our, our folks left. And so you have to hire and maintain trained and culturally competent staff. This is really hard work and it's not uncommon for people to feel like, you know, I can't do this anymore or I need higher pay, you know, for what, whatever their, uh, their reasons are for leaving. But, you know, it's healthcare and it can sometimes, sometimes be a problem. Um, I know I don't have a whole lot of time left because we want to definitely save about uh, 10 minutes left for questions. So I'm going to try to go through these, just touch on them. These are through, um, two other programs that we have going on within our university and out of our infectious disease division. So this again is a program started by Dr. Fanuki, our colleague. This is called the ACES team. It's an addiction consult and education service. And this was started in 2018. She accessed the same funding. Actually, I followed her path and accessed the same funding, the core funding, that Kentucky Opioid Response Funding. And the primary, a primary focus of this funding was inpatient management of opioid use disorder. So what we were finding was people were getting admitted uh, into the hospital with infections, and then they were leaving because they were in opioid withdrawal. And so Dr. Fanuki started this program so that uh, consults could happen um, to really uh, help these folks meet, not, not only, you know, we, this is a moment in time when hopefully you can help them get in into opioid use care, um, but also we don't want them to leave when they have a heart valve infection or a bone infection. And so this was, you know, twofold trying to help folks. Um, this is the team. Um, she's the medical director. There's a nurse admin lead. There's several physicians and nurse practitioners that she has, a nurse navigator, a clinical social work, and then peer support specialist. This is the bridge clinic, which has been very important. So once patients leave the hospital, if it's doable for them to come to that clinic, they can continue their opioid use care um, right there in the bridge clinic. Um, they do have walk-in times and they do um, um, partner very closely with their emergency department. Um, not all patients obviously can come to that because we serve people two and three hours away. And so they also help uh, coordinate patients finding a spot closer to their home base uh, to get their care if they can't get it there. Um, some of the challenges that Laura and her folks have pointed out, you can see their numbers just continue to climb. Um, I know they, they constantly have like 40 patients easily between the two hospitals that they're following. And this, this is a little bit of a breakdown. Now, this is getting a little bit old. I can't see the top, but I think this was 2020. Um, but you can see a large part of what they do is they start people on buprenorphine. They can also start people in the hospital on methadone, and a small percentage of people will be on the naltrexone. Some of their challenges, I've already mentioned stigma to you, and we found that a lot. And I, uh, this is listed number one. And to be honest with you, I feel like in the hospital, that is often our number one thing to overcome is stigma. And it can be from providers, and I've already mentioned culturally from people's family. I know right now on one of our services, we have a young woman who's been started on MOUD, but she's asked the team, do not talk about the MOUD in front of my family members that are coming to visit me because me being on this treatment would not be acceptable by them. How sad is that? So that there's often this educational point that we have to make with family members and the patient themselves. Um, sometimes, you know, I'm sorry, but if you're addicted to a substance, you're not necessarily going to stop just because you're in the hospital, particularly if you're not getting the treatment that you need to um, deal with that withdrawal. And so it's not uncommon for people to have in-hospital substance use. And this is often hard, not that we condone it, but um, I would say it's expected. 
And so this is often hard for the hospital administration and others, you know, to look at this and, and the thought might be, well, you just need to get out, right? And so this is, there's a lot of conflicts with that, a lot of, um, you know, we have to have a lot of conversations about it and do a lot of advocacy for the patient, not condoning that, but trying to understand it better. It's very complicated care coordination, and hopefully we've talked about that a lot already. And one of the things different here is that lack of photo ID. When a patient goes to get their MOUD outpatient, they often have to have a photo ID, right, or, or their um, uh, insurance card or whatever. And so that can be a problem not having that if they're homeless or if they've lost their billfold or whatever. And then limited supportive housing, that's huge in Lexington for us and surrounding counties. And also our skilled nursing facilities will not take our patients for various and sundry reasons, but it's uh, like maybe a half a percent or one percent of our patients that discharge that we can actually get them into a skilled nursing facility if it's needed. And then the retention and follow-up um, has always been challenging as well. Um, here are some of the, the successes is having that strength of a multidisciplinary team, the more voices advocating for the patient and for the treatment. And that helps reduce the stigma. And then we've had wonderful pharmacy collaboration with new clinical part protocols and bringing in some of these uh, uh, new uh, methods of treatment. And the uh, buprenorphine microdosing is something that we're, we're hoping to start soon at our clinic. And then Laura has been using that in the hospital as well. So um, I'm going to not talk too much about this, but I do have the reference. This is a, a study that Dr. Fanuki did inpatient where we looked at um, a big thing in our hospital in the past has been, oh, this person has a PICC line or an IV line. There's no way they can leave because they have drug use. And we've tried to make the point that really it's the chaos and the other issues that might be associated with um, drug use that could be more of a problem than actual drug use itself. So Dr. Fanuki did a study where she had 20 participants, 10 got their antibiotics, they were randomized, 10 got their antibiotics in the hospital, 10 got their antibiotics going home. If they went home, obviously they had to have a stable place to live and there were a lot of um, uh, stipulations, you know, they had to have running water, blah, blah, blah. And so these patients that were followed out patient, they did have to come into the clinic two and three times a week. So it was a big commitment from them. Um, and I'll show you her outcomes. Uh, one thing I did add here, uh, just to let you know, between the two groups, there was actually less illicit opioid use in 12 weeks post-discharge in the patients that left the hospital and got their IV antibiotics outpatient than there were that, than patients that stayed in-house. Um, so that was a surprise. It didn't reach statistical significance, but there definitely was that trend for less uh, illicit drug use uh, outpatient. So usual care meant they stayed in the hospital. Early discharge meant that they got this outpatient. You can see that the length of stay was significantly different in those patients that got to go home and get their IV antibiotics. And then the outpatient IV uh, antibiotics, of course, there were more for those patients. You know, the patients that went home with the antibiotics got more antibiotics outpatient. The final team, our final model that I would like to point out is a newer model. And um, it's not just about opioid use, but it's also those infections associated with injection drug use. And so this is a new model that um, Dr. Sammy Eldalati ha has been recruited to come to our facility and start. It's a multidisciplinary endocarditis team. Um, this is the team members, and you will see we're even expanding our team, not just to our ID champions, but we have folks like our CT surgeons and our neurosurgeons and our cardiologists and our ACES team. And so it's really bringing this team together now. They don't round um, on all these patients, but we have a weekly um, Zoom meeting and um, we talk about each of the patients that the endocarditis team is following on the consort service. And we try to approach it from a multidisciplinary team approach. Um, these are the goals to improve communication between the primary medical team and the subspecialties and um, increase access to surgical intervention and improve post-hospital follow-up and decrease mortality. This is a uh, more of a European model. 
uh, of endocarditis. If you look at the endocarditis guidelines, the European uh, endocarditis guidelines talk about uh, this kind of model. And so this initial work, we only started at the day after Labor Day, so September 2021. We've already had about 13 weekly multidisciplinary team meetings. I'm very pleased to say that we've had, um, I look every week to see, we've had over 20 people on every Zoom meeting and most of them stay for the entire hour. Um, we had 35 patients tw uh, two weeks ago. I said 40 now, I think it may even be 50, but there's been 40 patients that have been presented in this multidisciplinary fashion and uh, more than 40 patients have been followed. We've got three rotating ID faculty, three rotating APPs, and thus far, um, trainees have wanted to rotate. We've had one medical student sign up particularly for this, a second medical student requesting it for January, and our two HIV fellows who are PAs signed up. And I will say a thing about Dr. Fanuki's ACES team, education is a big part of that too, having the residents and trainees learn how to give uh, addiction therapy while they're on those services. So my final thoughts before we save time uh, for questions is it's hard work and it takes time and you just have to be patient with yourself. Um, we often find that our administration wants, wants results right now, but this has been a problem that we've been working on since 2008 and 2010. And so we've come a long way, we still have a long way to go. Each person you help could be a life saved. It's collaboration, collaboration. You need a coalition of the willing of the, as our friend um, friends at, at Yale have reminded me of on different things. You need to know your limitations and don't be afraid to reach out when you think, you know, we can't handle this here, but they could handle it at the bridge clinic or they might be able to handle it at psychiatry or whatever. Each team, team member is very valuable. Um, it's not just the people writing the prescriptions. It's the whole team that really make things happen. Monetary funds are crucial. We could not have gotten started without those initial uh, Age United funds and then the core funds that we have now. Dedicated team members are critical. As we saw as COVID hit and we had two team members that uh, left toward the middle of the pandemic. And that really, um, we had to just sort of shut down taking any new patients. And one of our colleagues who's now in Arizona has said this the last time we heard him talk, you could be the last medical provider to interact with this person. And I've had um, most recently one of my patients die. And I thought about that when I saw him and then he died. And so just remember, you know, be kind and remember you could be the last person to touch that person's life and make it, you know, make it big and do as much as you can to help them. Thank you so much for allowing me to um, be part of this and I will hand it over to, I think it's, uh, Daria, are you leading with the questions? Sure, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that fabulous uh, presentation and a description of what a robust pro program that you have there. Um, Liz, were you monitoring the chat? Did we have any questions in the chat? We have um, one per attendee with their hand up. I wonder if she would like to, if this person would like to talk and I can give her the opportunity to talk if that's okay. Leticia, did you want to ask your question? You can also put the questions in the chat room, if that is easier. I did want to make one comment, though, in your earlier part of the presentation, when you're talking about the AIDS United funding and the smaller and just the power of having that dyad. Um, yeah. I think it, it really is empowering to see yes. how two very dedicated people can really make yeah. a program begin and give some hope to those of us who are starting these yeah. programs in smaller settings. That's, that's exactly right. And I, and I say this to my colleague, Dr. Fanuki, all the time. You know, it took her and that, like you said, that one person, that other person, two people, sort of snowballed many of these efforts. And I think gave us all the courage and, um, you know, strength. Okay, let's take the next step. <laughs> you get braver and braver as you go along, I think. And, and I loved your 
you know, quote, celebrate the small victories, even with the patients, but I think we have to apply that too to our clinical settings. Celebrate yes. the small victories we are making in the clinical settings as we progress to developing these larger programs. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I've been struggling with lately is one of my patients, he comes in for sublocade, and I'm often disappointed because he's still struggling um, with cocaine. But before he was, when we, before he started on the sublocade, he had heroin and fentanyl in his urine. And we know that those are things that could kill him. And he has two daughters, he has older daughters. And so I just have to keep reminding myself sometimes this is harm reduction too, you know. Oh, that's a good, great question. I think someone asked about HAPWA. Um, yes, so particularly now, um, we, our, our newest person, our newest coordinator, Grant Lafferty, who's part of us, uh, he is a seasoned HIV Ryan White uh, care coordinator, and um, he is definitely looking at some of those. They're not a Officially, but we look at we look under all the rocks and everywhere we can um, to you know when we're trying to look for housing. But good points, and definitely Hopwa would be a great place to look. Yeah, we have an additional question in the Q and A. Do you find that some types of engagements with the intensive case managers work better than others? Hmm. I would say yes to that. And I don't know if any of my colleagues are on that want to feel free to jump in. I'm not sure what the person is getting at. Um, but definitely, I think when the, when the case manager goes in the room and sometimes even the provider, um, you know, you can't go into this in a hurry because the, the person, as sure as you do, you know, you're going to find out they're homeless or they don't have any food. And, and you know, you really just have to take a moment and, and really try to meet whatever need it is at that moment. And a lot of times it can be very different. I have one other question too. You mentioned the, the role of stigma, particularly in the inpatient setting. Yeah. I was just wondering if you had any strategies, um, yeah. successful strategies in addressing that. Yeah, so the ACES team, which again, that is that addiction team, that I think that has made a huge difference. Um, one of the things that uh, we tried to do early on was to get the teams to let the nursing staff put those consults in and empower the nurses who may be the very first line, you know, noticing that this person has an issue. And also, if you think about it, the nurses, they often do 12 hour shifts. So they're most impacted by someone that might be going through withdrawal or having mental health issues. And so I think trying to get the buy-in of the nursing staff was really important. One of the people that is a key member of that team, um, she's higher up in nurse administration. I mean, she's not like the, uh, the highest, but she's a very important part of that. And so I think that's a lot. Yes, yeah, someone just pointed out AOD case managers use motivational interviewing in a lot of patients, definitely. <laughs> Definitely motivational interviewing, I think, is really key. And I will say the ACES team definitely have a lot of different materials they give to these patients um, because they're in the hospital, some of them. And so they have books, coloring books, um, peers coming by and spending time with the patient. And our RAP team members have noticed that sometimes our patients just really appreciate it if they um, bring over snacks or try to engage just sitting and talking to them because many of them may be two and three hours away, even in the hospital, and then may not get any visitors. And so our RAP team, just going and sitting and just chatting with them can make a huge difference too. And, and make a huge difference from them leaving the hospital until they're stable to do so. That's the situation. Great questions. Do we have any other questions? There are no additional questions in the Q&A or the chat at this time. And I do see that Liz has put into the chat, anyone who's interested in continuing education or a certificate of participation, please use that link um, to complete your evaluation within two weeks of today's session. 
So I don't think we have any additional questions. I want to thank you. This was a fabulous talk. Um, and thank you for bringing your expertise. I think we've all learned something today. Thank you so much for having me and for the great questions and the good time being with you guys. You too. <laughs> thank and you. And everybody have a great